Oh, Sim, saying it is a uh, great topic, mitral valve and valve, valve and ring, and valve and MAC for another answer of therapeutic options for MAC. Cause All right. Um, so I think Seibel's a hard act to follow, uh, but it's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks to Lee, Eric, and Mark again. Should we get the questions? Questions up. Mm. So be careful. These are all that negative except questions. So all of the following are high risk features for developing LV outflow tract obstruction and valve and valve transcatheter mitral valve replacement except. So four are risk, risk features and one is not. Okay. Okay. All of the following transcatheter valves have been deployed in the mitral position on a clinical and or study basis except. This is very interesting. Never heard of that. Clearly, this is a good question. <laughs> yeah, it, it's funny because I made that name up. I was just going to say you made that up for sure. And I was trying to think of something that would sound kind of cool. I was like, strategent, you know? So nice job, guys. <laughs> All of the following access routes have been used to perform mitral valve transcatheter interventions except. <laughs> modified. Clearly modified. Can't yell out the answers. <laughs> All right, great. Thank you. All right, so we're going to talk about transcatheter mitral valve and ma valve, and yes, also a little bit on valve and ring and valve and MAC. Um, I have no uh, disclosures, so I'm going to start with a case. This was the first uh, Cornell experience case of valve and valve in 2013. This is an 80 year old female. History of rheumatic heart disease, she had had two prior mitral valve replacements, a tricuspid valve replacement, AFib, New York Heart Association class four symptoms. She was being admitted for multiple times with CHF. She was evaluated by the surgeons and uh, not thought to be a great surgical candidate. Her surgeries of note, if you look at the bottom, her last uh, mitral valve was replaced in 1996 with a 27 Carpentier Edwards, and in 2004 she had a tricuspid valve done. Um, so her coronaries were okay. Uh, she did have a right atrial thrombus on catheterization. She had a mild transaortic gradient of about 10 and an elevated LVEDP. On TEE, and you can see why the surgeons are not so excited by this case, though there's a left atrial and a right atrial thrombus. Uh, she has a severely de decreased right ventricular function. Uh, her LVEF is, is actually normal and the bioprosthetic mitral valve has four plus MR and moderate MS with a 16 millimeter mean gradient. So, you know, this is starting off back in the day where this was not a routine thing, at least, you know, the STS score was incredibly high. She was not a surgical candidate. And so the discussion and decision was made to go for an Edward Sapien 23 valve with transapical axis at the time. And we will talk about the axis situations with transcatheter mitral valves in a little bit. So uh, you can see kind of in the transapical approach, same to transapical TAVI, which was where most of our experience was at the time. We, you know, you put in a sheath, you get a wire across, from across the bioprosthetic mitral valve into the, into the uh, pulmonary, into left atrium, and then you deploy the valve under rapid pacing. If it, there it goes, it's a little bit of hang up. And that procedure was successful and she was extubated and discharged. She had about a week long admission afterwards. And so, you know, when we look at, uh, this is a, every year this is gonna be a, this is a, a field that's constantly in motion. You know, at the present time, the guidelines still say that for considering transcatheter mitral valve and valve in the US, 
you really want to do it for non-surgical or high-risk candidates for valve and valve. And that's really the only situation where you can think about it, though I do think that will change in the up-and-coming trials of the in vivo valves. Um, you know, the guy, last set of guidelines on valve disease from 2017, um, they left aortic valve stenosis. You know it's approved for intermediate risk and being tested in low-risk patients, but the guidelines are, are, are lagging behind. And But for mitral valve repair, and I do think this was as much geared towards mitral clip um, as it is for transcatheter mitral valve and valve, the guidelines don't give us so much guidance on how to do, but really only, again, in high-risk situations. So what's your approach in doing this procedure? Well, first of all is appropriate valve sizing. And when we think of valve sizing, you have to know the bioprosthetic valve you're working with. Don't just believe the operative report. You actually have to look at it on fluoroscopy or on CT because sometimes the operative report will be wrong. And when we're looking at it, realize that the, it's the internal diameter we care about, more than the valve size, more than the outer diameter, and more than the, what the, you know, the label says. But you can use, you can help by looking at publications of what the valves are and what the internal diameter should be. There's a great app, which most everybody in this room, I'm sure, is aware of, for both mitral valve and valve and aortic valve and valve cases, where you can, it shows you, based on the particular bioprosthetic valve that's there, um, you can look at and see how, um, uh, you know, which valve would be appropriate to implant. But I do think for every case, it is incredibly important to not just rely on the app, but to actually measure the valve, either via CT scan, which is the usual standard, or in patients who can't afford a cardiac CT for contrast reasons or otherwise, a 3D echo. So what are the commercially available valves in the U.S. for mitral valve and valve? Um, I'm not talking about study valves at this point. Um, well, the XT was used and was what insurances were paying for up to a certain period of time, but now that since S3 is now approved for mitral and aortic valve and valve since June of last year, pretty much all the cases are being done with Edwards S3 with Commander um, system. Uh, the Melody valve has also been implanted in the mitral position, uh, though this is less ideal in adult patients. So that strategium valve is the only fake valve in that, in that group. Um, I, will I think mention, it was strategent. Or whatever actually. I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are a few other valves that are currently being studied for in vivo mitral position valves. Those are the other valves that are listed, the cardiac, the intrepid, and the tendine. Uh, those are not as much for valve and valve, but you'll hear more about them, and there's trials that are ongoing. So access choice. I think Saibal um, alluded to this in his talk. You can look at either a transapical or a transeptal approach. In general, the apex is it's incredibly appealing in some ways. It's a direct line of sight with the mitral valve. You can do a double valve case where you do the mitral and then lean over and do the aortic valve. Um, you can avoid left atrial clot. You can also deal with paravalvular leaks that occur in that same way, and there's a question of surgical engagement, though I think the, the field is obviously shifting over more towards a transeptal approach, the advantages being that it's, uh, it's less invasive, and patients in the TAVI world tend to do better because they're often sicker patients with a less invasive approach. There's less pain involved, which is, a, you know, as much as it's not a, 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 a septal incision, a, a sternotomy, you still have a lot of splinting. But going back to the different techniques, there is actually a modified transeptal delivery approach, which I've never done or heard of, but where you actually get apical and you go transeptal and you create a wire for stability. So that was where that question was coming from. And then there's open transatrial approaches that have also been described and reported. So positioning, and this is maybe the key point when it comes to delivering a mitral valve and valve. You have to know thy valve and what it looks like on fluoroscopy, and each valve has a different place where the actual annulus is of the valve, the, the bioprosthetic annulus is what I'm talking about. And you want to position the skirt of your Edwards valve to that sewing ring so that it's, it's precisely on. You want to minimize catheter deployment during deployment. I know a lot of TAVIs now in our own institution are done. We do them with moderate sedation. Patients are awake, they don't get swans routinely, they kind of get it quickly, anesthesia is there, but it's moderate or deep sedation. These are not cases that I think should be done. They should not be done like that. They should be done with general anesthesia, and they should be done with TEE guidance. I think that's incredibly helpful. I, I don't know if anybody disagrees with that statement, but I think all the controlled situation you can be in in doing transcatheter mitral valves and valves is incredibly important. Um, what do you worry about in positioning? Well, one of the things, one of the problems that uh, we are appreciating more and more is the scepter of LVOT obstruction. This is 
mentioned in the surgical literature. This can occur even with surgical bioprosthetic uh, mitral valves, but it's not as well described and it's being seen much more in these valve and valves. Some of the things that can affect your LVOT obstruction potential, one is if you implant the valve more deeply into the left ventricle, it kind of makes sense when you look at that diagram to the right. Um, if you flare the ventricular portion of the valve with the balloon, that's going to potentially cause more obstruction. We talk about the aortic mitral annular angle, and that was one of the questions again, that a narrower angle is more concerning than a wider angle where the, you know, greater than 120 degrees is considered less problematic, and the presence of a septal bulge. If you have any sort of asymmetric septal hypertrophy, which a lot of our older patients have, that's something to be concerned about. This is how you kind of measure that aortomitral angle, and this is, again, you want to be aware of this. This particular patient uh, has a 111 degree mitral angle, so that is, we would consider that higher risk. There have been a lot of approaches that we've described and have been discussed over the last year and a half for um, how you account for LVOT obstruction. One, the most obvious is choose your patients wisely. Secondly, you can adjust your implantation depth. If you think there's a higher risk, you can implant a little, a little bit more shallow. Third, people have described alcohol septal ablations after the fact in patients who've had LVOT obstruction. And fourth, I think in Sky we saw a great case example of three or four cases where they did laceration of the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve where they actually did transapical on bypass ECMO. They went in, they lacerated the mitral valve and the thought is that you're preventing that systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve in conjunction with the symmetric hypertrophy and thus you can get rid of or prevent some of the obstruction. So uh, when won't it just do? Well, remember the same principle applies to any valve and valve procedure. Every time you implant a valve in another ring, in another ring, each progressive valve is going to have a slightly smaller orifice area. That's the nature of the game. So know when, there's, you know, when, when it's getting too small and you don't think there'll be enough ability to pass cardiac output through your new valve. So, case number two, an uh, 82-year-old female. She'd had a bioprosthetic MVR done in 2000 with a 31 EPIC. Uh, she's coming in with heart failure, like a lot of these patients. She's a Jehovah's Witness. So when you look at her transesophageal echo, um, not a huge amount of MR, mild to moderate, but their mean gradient was about 10, and the valve area was about 1.2. Um, and so, you know, her STS score is actually not that, well, it's high, it's 8%, but not like the other patient, which was around 30%. Um, and the big concern by the surgical team was that she would not accept uh, blood transfusions. And so, given that, the decision was made to do off-label valve and valve percutaneous intervention. Um, and so, based on her annular area of 630, uh, this was suitable for an Edwards S329 valve. And this was done transeptally. So transeptal approach, I, you know, I've heard in, you know, all the, we had a great lecture by Mark earlier about the, which, where you should cross the septum. You generally do need to balloon the septum and do it just to get space to get the catheter across. Uh, we've got great wires now that allow safe uh, uh, stability in the left ventricle for getting the catheter across. But I do think in general we try to go posterior and superior in the septum when we're trying to deliver this. The reason being you want a more of a sweeping angle to get to the LV as opposed to an acute angle to get the, the sizable catheter across. I, I'm curious to hear, Saibal, because I heard your comment about the uh, new mitral clip, so I'll be, I'll be interested to know what you think. Um, yeah, okay. Actually, Sabrina, what happened with the superior, yeah. when you advance the valve, it gets caught on the, on the roof. Ring. So we feel it's posterior and actually inferior posterior blade. <laughs> and what you can do is that the valve is self-centered and it does. I, yeah, that's right. And I, I think it depends on how big your HR as well. I mean, if you're dealing with a large left atrium, you probably want to go a little lower. You, the bottom line is, though, you want to be post, a little more posterior, right? That's posterior the bottom line. The you want to be posterior. Yeah. Posterior is the key. And then you have to decide whether you want to be more superior or inferior based on your anatomy. So here on this stick, we're uh, actually, we're, this, we're pretty midline here and posterior. So we're going across. We have, we ballooned uh, the septum. We have the catheter across. We have a confido wire. And so then we get our stent positioned in place and we go ahead and deploy the stent under rapid pacing, and then afterwards you can take a look. The valve, you, this is just a post-deployment, just to expand. 
And on TEE, you've got a nice functioning valve. The gradient is only two millimeters of mercury. There's really no MR, and you have a pretty nice result. Um, you know, in general, this procedure, when it goes smoothly, goes incredibly smoothly. Most of the problems that we see, uh, that we've seen, are LVOT obstruction. Again, that's why I kind of spend so much time talking about it. I think the issue comes, you deployed the valve, you've got the obstruction, then what do you do? <laughs> now you've got like this person who's getting significant SAM and you know, gradients as high as 30, 40, 50 at rest, and then it's a big problem because a lot of these patients are not operative to begin with. So I really do think patient selection is important. So valve and ring, the data on valve and ring, as you'd expect or maybe not expect, is a lot worse than valve and valve. That's because there's a lot more variability in rings. Rings come in all shapes and sizes. There are some that are not circular. There are some that are only partial rings. In general, you need the th characteristics of a ring that you need to do this procedure, or it needs to be rigid. It needs to be circular. It needs to be radiopaque. You need to be able to see it. If you can't see it on fluoroscopy, that's a problem. Um, you need to have adequate size for the same valve and valve issue. So these are some of the rings in general that are amenable to uh, transcaster mitral valve replacements. And when patients are getting surgical rings, we've actually mentioned to our surgeons, do think that if they ever need a procedure down the line, which ring you're putting in. Um, so in this particular case, this patient, uh, you know, is the, as well as the procedurally, it's the same sort of thing, rapid RV pacing, real-time TEE visualization, and you want to make sure that you have good, you want to be even more sure that you have total hemodynamic standstill and stability when deploying this, because I think in general the rings stretch more than the, than the valves, than the valve rings themselves. Thoughts about it? What are you guys' experience with, uh, with mitral valves and rings? Ring is yeah. Because, um, can you show the previous picture? Yeah, sure. You see that most of this is a ring, top of the other ring. Yeah. So what happens is sometimes they don't circularize. And as a result of that, you can have a paragraph and leak. And you actually can see that in the aortic ring, even in the medial side. Of yeah. The so that's one of the problems. And so you have to inflict the paragraph ring. I actually had a patient who developed a LVOT obstruction and a paragraph ring and had severe hemolysis. Second thing about uh, because you, the, the frame of the previous valve is not there to position it, it can actually go inside more than the LVOT. So LVOT obstruction is a higher risk than the ring valve and ring. And that's consistent with yeah. what's published as well. No, absolutely. So the valve in MAC, and I'm going to thank my colleague Tamim uh, for this case. Uh, he was a, a colleague and an interventionalist. Uh, so this is a patient who has. Uh, and severe MAC-related mitral stenosis, some degree of MR as well. The gradients across mean of eight, and the patient was in quite a bit of heart failure. This, is, um, this patient was included in, that, in the mitral valve and MAC registry that was recently published this month in Jack, and so I'll show you one of those articles. This patient's based on valve area by CT, and this is where you don't have a table, you don't have an app, you are completely reliant on your imagers, so make sure the imaging is pristine in measuring the annulus, the area in these patients, and usually multiple types of imaging, you know, both TE and CT are required, and that's, that's sort of what the standard is for if you're gonna do a mitral valve and MAC case. Um, again, you, how you deploy it is a little bit of, there's a little bit of discrepancy on, but the, generally you want to find the most stable MAC position, and you're going to deploy it at the, around the same degree of de uh, implantation depth. Uh, same sort of principle applies in how you do it, but when you go in, uh, there's a lot more risk for movement of the valve, just because you have, as you'd expect, even though there's annular calcification, it's not a fixed ridge. You can have cracking, you can have a break, so you have to be very, very cautious. And notice how the balloon goes up. Even though they're rapid pacing and ridiculous standstill, you want to go up very slowly and carefully when you deploy this, so you don't have any movement or slippage. And this particular case uh, turned out quite well, and it's a, it's a, a good situation, though. So if you look at the overall data, uh, in 2016 they published kind of the, there was quite a number of complications seen in the data, both LVOT obstruction, device embolization, and perforation, including uh, patient death. And just this last month, uh, the mitral valve and MAC uh, published experience data was presented, was published at 126 patients and showed that overall it's doable, it's a procedure, but it, these patients have a pretty high 30-day and one-year mortality um, survival by Kaplan-Meier curve of about 
it's 55, 60% overall. And that's not just cardiac, because they're older and they're incredibly high risk patients, but it, it clearly is, um, it's not perfect. So we're still waiting for some of the other devices in vivo. Yep. So sorry, for your for mortality, the mortality is? The mortality, so survival was 58%. Yeah, 25% of the five That was it, how many days? 30 how, days? How yeah. So 25% no. 30 days, 58% at one year. You know what? Or no, or 58% survival at one year. Yeah. The editorial, the editorial was written by a uh, chief of surgery. Oh, really? Yeah, Danny Ramsey and friends are they really scared that they died. Yeah, well. If you read that editorial. Yeah. It, it's actually, you, you know what, like, I'm going to tell you, my institution, that ain't going to fly. No, 25% of the time. for a procedure, not going to fly. Yeah. Uh, it's the, the I, I think this is not prime time. There's no question. There's no question. This is done on extreme cases. There's actually and a study, uh, Eric, on the use of Tendai yeah. on Mac. Yeah. Just starting. Uh, has a study on this one. Really? And I think that's where, where it's going to be the future. Using the Edwards S3 is not the future for a valve and Mac. The advantage of the Tendai is that it's removable. If you think there's LVOT obstruction, you can take it out. But the, the exactly. problem with this is that once you're so to transapical conclude, or transfemoral, transapical tendine. Yeah, so yeah. So it's transapical, though they're designing a transeptal yeah. as well, right? Mm -hmm. So they're going to be doing both eventually. Yeah. And so that's where I do think there is some benefit in keeping your transapical skills alive, because at least the first generation of these valves are going to be transapically done. So to conclude, transcatheter mitral valve and valve replacement is a viable option in patients who are high surgical risk or not surgical candidates. Um, you have to have careful pre-planning pre imaging. You don't, this is not a time to be, uh, do kind of moderate sedation. You want to be conservative and have the full thing like back in the day of early TAVI when you do it. And the experience and outcomes with mitral valve and ring, though those are pretty good. Valve and, or valve and valve rather, but valve and ring and valve and MAC are not so good. So currently the newer valve platforms are waiting for those and I think that's where the uh, future lies because mitral valve, the epidemiology of the disease is obviously huge. And that's it. Thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one question, Matt has a question. Just because you're from New York and you guys are friends, I'll let you ask it. It's true. Blame Canada. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah. I guess. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I guess. You mentioned that the size of the valve is kind of a limitation. You certainly can do valve, yeah. valve, valve. There's now been a number of reports and or publications of intentionally fracturing surgical valves. In the aortic position, in the pulmonary position. Yeah. LVOT obstruction is the potential issue if you expand too far, yeah. or you're going to compress on circumflex and other issues, but has that been considered? I think it's a different problem. I mean, fracturing pulmonary valves is done. Fracturing aortic valves is done. In the mitral position, boy, I have never heard of it. I mean, I, we've talked, yeah. Really the, the risks, the risks the yeah. The risks really outweigh the benefits, yeah. so we, we don't do it. I think if you really had someone implanted a ring that was too small and you just, you think that whatever you put in is going to be entirely undersized, like, you know, patient prosthesis mm -hmm. mismatch, then, boy, you really push the surgeons yeah. to go the, about uh, You can just disrupt that area. Yeah.